We're going to be talking about improving design through test-driven development. Uh, my name is Sam Brown. Uh, this is Mike McGarr. Uh, I'm a consultant here at Excel Consulting. Uh, I've been a software engineer for about 11 years. Uh, I'm also the DevOps evangelist here. Um, I'm a certified Scrum Master and a Puppet certified professional. Hey, my name's Mike. I've also been in the industry for about 11 years. Uh, I currently actually work as the, the Typo. I'm the director, not the directory, of uh, DevOps for Blackboard Learn, their flagship product. Um, I'm a, also the founder of the DC Continuous Integration Delivery and Deployment Meetup. Uh, we're a local meetup that we sometimes meet here and we'll meet in DC and we talk about a lot of things we talk about, trying to talk about today. So um, before we get started, I want to quick show of hands of how many people are consider themselves a programmer or engineer and they write code daily? Keep, keep your hands up if you've written a, a unit test before. Keep your hands up if you write unit tests every day. Keep your hands up if you write unit tests before you write code. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just curious. Okay, so what we're gonna, before we get started on talking about test driven development, I wanna just clarify some differences between tests and where we're gonna focus. Um, I like to use this, this diagram to kind of explain the, the landscape of testing and what they, what they apply to. Um, there's types of tests that focus on external quality. There's types of tests that focus on internal quality. Um, our talk's going to focus down here on internal quality. These tend to be more developer-focused tests, focus on the design and the architecture of the system. Um, and specifically, we're going to focus on unit tests. And, um, unit, and we're going to talk about why, what a unit test is and why it's different than an integration test, because there's often common confusion between the two. Um, but a lot of the principles we're going to talk about as far as design and how tests first works also apply to acceptance tests, and um, I think someone else will cover that today. If not, um, you know, come talk to me about that. <clears throat> so a unit test, uh, this is a, like a common point of confusion, and we, I like to use this acronym of FIRST to find what an actual unit test is, and this is a good way for you to look at your unit tests and say whether it is a unit test or not. Um, a unit test should be fast, which means it has to execute in less than a tenth of a second. So if you were on a project and you complain about slow unit tests, they're more than likely you're not writing unit tests, you're writing integration tests. Um, a test should be independent. And what that means is every single test should be testing one condition and one condition only. Another way to look at that is a test should have one cert per test. So this is something that most developers don't, if who've written unit tests before, will, will kind of give me a frowning face or, or say, I don't like that, but um, trust me, it, it's helpful. Um, a test should be repeatable, which means every time I execute that unit test, I should get the exact same result. Um, and in order to do that, I need to isolate my unit test and my code from external dependencies. So my test cannot depend on the file system, <coughs> cannot depend on a database being, being around, cannot depend on a web service. Because those things are variable and they can and cannot be there, and you want to make sure you isolate all, the whole environment of which the code or test is running. So you need to make sure your test is repeatable. Self-verifying. Um, this one seems kind of uh, obvious, but you need to be able to get a green or red result. You need to get whether it's true or false. The result of the unit test should not be left to uh, interpretation. So I've seen tests, unit tests that actually do not have asserts in there. Um, you can't tell whether the test passed or failed if you don't have an assert or some way of verifying whether it passed or not. Um, and then timely. And that basically means refers to when you are going to write the test. And timely really means you should be writing your tests before you write code. And the rest of our talk is going to talk about that, which really means we're referring to test-driven development. So. so as Mike just said, we're talking about test-driven development as it relates to unit tests, not at, not at other levels. And what we're looking for, the mantra of test-driven development is red, green, refactor. So, Red relates to a failing test. So when you're running in JUnit or any other language, when you're running your test runner, um, you're going to write a failing test first. You're going to get that red, which says, I know what it is. I know the behavior that I want to test. So you want to start with the behavior of the system. You write a test to demonstrate the behavior of that system. And that test is going to fail because you've not written any production code yet. The next step is green. That is, actually write the code that makes that test pass, that satisfies that behavior of the system. Okay? So we go red and green, failing test, passing test. And then when we go back and look at our code, now that we've got a passing test, what we are able to do 
is refactor the code because we've got this test to fall back on. So many times we write code and we don't actually go back and, and refactor anything. We say, all right, well the test passed, we don't really need to change anything because the code does what I want. But in order to simplify code, make code straight, more straightforward, more readable by other developers, and more reusable, you want to have that ability to refactor. And without the test to fall back on, that's, you, you get into those minefields that Fadi talked about previously where I'm, I'm afraid to change something because I don't really know what it's going to impact. This is your safety net right here. That's the green. So when you go red, green, refactor, you refactor, then you move on to the next piece of behavior, and this cycle continues as you add behavior to your system. Um, the one thing we say is, in, is the golden rule of TDD is never write production code without a failing test. So that's what you're always looking to do. You never want to continue and just kind of say, oh, well, I, now I know where I'm going with this. I want to keep writing code. Always write your failing test first, then write your passing code, and then you can refactor. I'm going to show you why you want to do that. So one thing that we all kind of assume about tests, and I think most people talk about when you're thinking about writing unit tests for your code, is improving quality. That's the number one thing people say. We need to be writing code so we improve the quality of our code. Um, and when people were talking about that a lot of times, what they're really saying is when we go back and go back and write tests for code that we've already written. And when you do that, this is kind of the value curve that you get out of it, right? So when you first start writing tests, you're getting a lot of value out of it. We're really improving the quality, we're finding bugs, we're improving the code. But as you start to get the code coverage really high, like you know, like 85, 90% of covered by tests, it's really tough to squeeze out that last little bit and the effort that you're putting into writing the tests not really giving you the value anymore that you want to get out of the test. So you're really putting in a lot of time and effort, and you're not getting the value. But when you're doing TDD, what you're really going to see is that, that that effort and attention, as you continue to put it in, you continue to get value because you're not just using it to get quality, you're using it to improve the design of your system. Uh, I talked on the previous slide about the fact that you're writing the behavior first, you're writing the test first to test the behavior of your system. So what you're doing is you're really driving the design of your system by writing those tests first and then writing the code behind it. You're not writing all your code and then coming in later and trying to test it because then it may not even be testable. And then it's difficult to refactor and you get into the ball of mud and the spaghetti code. It's very difficult to go back in time. But if you start with TDD, you're going to see that your code evolves and that the effort you put in is equal to the value that you're going to get out of it. OK, so when we talk about um, test driven development is a tool for design. The first thing we have to talk about is kind of what, what do we mean by good design? Um, so one attribute of a good design or a well-designed system is uh, coupling, how well your code is coupled to other code in the system. So um, essentially what we mean by coupling is if I make a change to one part of the system, does that necessitate changes on another part of the system, right? And so I have two examples of two classes here, a driver class and a car driver class. And the first example, the driver class is coupled to the vehicle interface, right? So it, um, it only cares about the vehicle interface. If I make a change to how the car works or how the trunk works, I don't have to change the driver class because it doesn't care necessarily about the details. So that's what we call a loosely coupled design. The car driver class would be tightly coupled to a concrete implementation of a vehicle, which is the car. So if I change the interface or add a method to the car or then I, I might be changing, I might require to change the car driver class. So this is tightly coupled. In our designs, we want to aspire to have loosely coupled designs as much as possible, and that allows us to make changes to parts of the system without having to worry about the impact to other parts of the system. So one of the other design principles um, that we like to talk about is cohesion. So I think we've all probably seen this, perhaps in a UTIL class or something like that, where you've got the parser. The parser does everything. Um, and the problem with the parser doing everything, if you start to think about all of the different pieces that go into parsing a URL or XML or JSON, or I don't have a presentation, there we go. Um, then you're going to have a lot of dependencies built into this class. You might have something internal to this class where you're keeping state or something like that, and you're afraid to change it because maybe the other parser method uses it or something like that. So what we're saying is, is that this has low coherence. It, there's a lot of interdependencies here that could be moved out. And when you talk about something with high coherence, it makes a little more sense is to break these pieces out and have one responsibility. 
Okay, so you may have all heard of the single responsibility principle before. This is it, pretty much in action. So JSON parser doesn't have to worry about how you parse the URL, how to parse XML, they're all separated. When you need to go change how JSON is parsed, you're only doing it in one place. This makes sense initially, this makes sense from a long-term standpoint in a design. So when we talk about design, it's hard to avoid the SOLID acronym. So has anyone heard of SOLID before? Okay, so I'm, I, I, I definitely apply the principles of SOLID. I tend to mess up sometimes on the actual definitions, but we'll, we'll cover that. Um, SOLID principles, I, I find that when I talk about coupling and cohesion, or co yeah, cohesion and SOLID, they're kind of overlapping and interrelated. So you can think about your design from just a coupling and cohesion perspective, and find that a little easier to understand. Um, or you can think about your design from this perspective, and there's a lot of overlap. So there's five principles that Uncle Bob Martin um, defined, and then Michael Feathers actually rearranged into a nice, solid acronym. The first one's a single responsibility principle, which Sam mentioned, which is essentially your code should be doing one thing and one thing only. That's the simplest uh, responsibility to understand, or principle to understand. The open-close principle says that your cl class or method should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So this has to do with uh, making sure that, has a lot to do with, with um, coupling your code and your design and making sure that inherent, your inherent structure is correct and you're using abstractions correctly and in interfaces correctly. Um, the list off substitution principle essentially means, and I for, always forget the actual definition, but um, it's re, you sh, your object should be replaceable by subtypes. Um, another way to think about this is design by contract. So you, um, you should think about that's an easy way to think about the list off substitution principle. Uh, interface segregation principle is uh, many client specific interfaces are better than one master interface. And that really goes back to our previous example of cohesion. So we have we showed four different very specific interfaces instead of one master interface. It's much easier to maintain a system and understand what that parser does and look at the code and say it's only going to depend on this type of logic. And then the last one, uh, a lot of people are familiar with the dependency inversion principle, which means my code should depend on an abstraction and not a concrete implementation, which is what we just talked about with coupling. So you can think about these principles, um, or you can think about, I think, coupling and cohesion. I find coupling and cohesion to be a lot easier to understand. All right. So Instead of just telling you guys what good design is, what we're going to spend the rest of the presentation to do is talking through how you evolve a design using tests. Because it's hard to understand how you can write tests and actually get a better design without showing you. Um, and when Sam and I started talking about putting this talk together, we said, you know, let's get up there and let's write code, let's you know, do that. And then we got scared like a week before and we decided we're not going to write code, we're just going to show you slides of code. So um, you can make fun of us later for not being great enough. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, uh, essentially what, what you would do in a code kata with, with Fadi's software craftsmanship user group. Um, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem in one of those katas called the bowling game. And this is, you would write, in this kata, you would write code that would solve the score, how to, figure out how to score a game of bowling. So I don't, I don't know how many people have bowled before. I'm, I assume most of you guys have. But the way you score bowling is there's 10 frames per game. And in each frame, you roll twice. So there's two rolls per frame. And then, unless there's a strike, if you roll a strike, which means you knock down all the pins, then um, there's only one roll for that frame. And then there's a special way to calculate spares, and there's a special way to calculate strikes. So it starts off as a very simple uh, problem, and it gets more complicated when you start adding on more and more requirements. So it's a good problem to uh, demonstrate through code. So any questions before we start diving directly into code? All right. So when we get started with TDD or writing code, the first, I'm going to work. Code examples we're going to use are all in um, Java and JUnit. But if you're a .NET developer, uh, PHP developer, the, the principles and, and you should be able to pick up most of the stuff. So when I start off writing uh, tests or unit tests, or I'm going to the first thing I'm going to do is write if, um, a test that ensures that my JUnit setup is correct. So this test does nothing more then ensure that when I call the fail method of JUnit, that I actually it returns, says I failed. Just making sure my class path is correct and everything like that. So this is the starting point, because if you are trying to write your first test and JUnit's not configured correctly, you're gonna get a lot of false positives. It's just a sanity check. So when I run this test, 
um, I get a failure. And we're going to use this bar at the bottom to indicate green, red, throughout this, and you guys get to recognize this cadence. <clears throat> okay, so once I get that, I'm going to start writing my first test. So the first requirement I'm going to target is what happens when I try to create, what happens when I try to grab the score of the game when I haven't rolled anything. So the game has just started, the score. And we know the score will probably be zero, but before I, get, before I move on to the code, I'm going to write out a method, a test method, that actually has the, the requirement that I want. We want this to be somewhat readable. And there's a lot of uh, opinions about how the structure of the unit test name should be written. And I've flip-flopped back and forth on how I've written unit test names. But the, the, the thing I always stick to is describing what I'm trying to test, right? So if I flip to the next one, um, I've started right here by writing the first and I've already started to make design decisions about what my code's going to do. So the first line of this test is I'm creating an object called game. I'm declaring that my system's going to depend on an object called game, and I'm creating an instance of that. And you can see my, my IDE has already told me this is red, right? So I don't I haven't compiled it, but this is good. This, this right there is immediately a failing test. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a, an assertion. So this is, a, for those who have never written unit tests before, um, this asserts, assert equal basically says that I want to make sure that when I call the game's score method, it returns zero. If it does, then we're good, it's green. If it doesn't, it's red. Okay. So setting up this test, I've made a couple design decisions. One, that I have an object called game, and two, that it's going to have a score method. So now I'm starting to think about, and one way to look at this is I'm starting to think about this class and these set of classes that I'm going to be working on from a consumer's perspective, right? So if you've written APIs before, the good way to think about how a customer or client or a calling class will, write, will interface with your code is to write tests against that. So you can start to evolve your API and say, okay, this doesn't make sense because it's not actually doing something. So it's a good way to design the interface. So I made this a very simple um, design decisions and then my test fails because actually I can't even run my tests yet because I have compilation errors. So I, and I've already talked about design decisions. So the next thing I'll do is I'll resolve the, the compilation error. So I'll, in the class, I'll, I'll create a class called game with score method that returns zero, right? So a couple things are here. One, I'm, you might not do this, but I've created the class right inside of my test. Um, a lot of people refer to this as TDD like you mean it. So you just write your, your, your resolution inside the test. I find it sometimes easier if you're learning just to write the, the, the inner classes there because then you don't have to flip between two different windows and you can run a little faster. And then eventually, once you get your class working the way you want to, you extract it out into a full uh, class in its own file. The other thing I've done here is I'm returning zero, and I'm hard coding the result. So when you're doing TDD, this is something that you're also going to have to get used to, is that I'm not making design decisions up front. I'm making the minimal amount of decisions I need to make to pass my test. So right now, in the production code, I would never hard code zero as a result. But because I'm deferring my design decisions until as late as possible, I'm going to do that to pass my tests. And I'm going to trust that as I write more and more tests, I'm going to write more and more conditions that will force me to write better code. Does that make sense? OK. So I run my test. It passed. So I'm excited. I'm going to move on to the next test. So the next test is score. Calculating the score if I roll all gutter balls. So the first one is the score at the beginning of the game. Now I'm going to say I'm going to roll nothing but gutter balls. I'm, I'm the world's worst bowler. All right, so I've written my test method with the name score with all gutter balls, and then um, I'm going to go ahead and fill what that is. So here I've done, it looks similar, so I've created my game instance again, but now I'm creating a for loop that I'm going to roll 20 times. So remember, we have 10 frames in bowling, two times you roll twice, so that's 20 rolls. And then I've made the second design decision here, here, which is I need a way to tell my, my game object that I'm going to roll and knock down a certain number of pins. So I've created a roll method, right? And so kind of like my ID is telling me, hey, you, you know, you did something wrong, you got a failing test, okay, so I need a roll method. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the roll method to my game object, and that passes. Now, right now, it passes because none, none of my tests have defined that I, can, I need to do anything. So I don't have to add any logic in here, I'm just defining that interface, and because I'm passing zero, my previously hard-coded value of zero passed the test. So developers might not feel comfortable doing this, but you, what you'll find is that as we go through this, you'll, you'll, you'll be forced to make decisions 
but you're not making decisions prematurely. So we're, and one of the tenets of TDD is you're, you're, by doing it this way, you're avoiding what's known as gold plating. So we're not going to add so much code. Like as, as development as engineer, I've looked at code and said, I can think of an awesome design. I can add this feature on and this feature on, and it can log, and it can do this and that. By doing it this way, you're just focusing on what it needs to do, and you're writing the minimal code to pass the test. Okay, so my test passed, and I'm going to move on. But before I do that, um, we're going to talk. We've noticed that the two tests I've written have some duplication in there. So I have two lines that are the same in each of my test methods. So both of them are calling game at the beginning. So what I'm going to do is we're going to refactor our tests to make them have to, to ensure they have a better design. So if I go move on, I in my my test I've created a private instance of the game object, and then I've used a convention in most testing frameworks to set up the, uh, and initialize that test so that before annotation before the setup method will be called before each of my test methods. So when I when the when the JM test runner run, runs this test, it's going to set up the game object. And then if it runs this test, it's going to set up the game object again. In JUnit, I don't need a teardown method because with the way JUnit runs in um, I think in newer versions like four, um, it's going to create a new instance of my test class per test. So I don't need to have anything cleaning up. But if you're in .NET and I think NUnit, and uh, I know Stevens around here somewhere will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you have to have, it doesn't do that. So you pretty much have to have a cleanup method in there. So just, that's just a sideboard of thing. But whenever you're, you're using something that's common between all tests, just make sure you're cleaning up so you don't you know, pollute the other tests with, uh, with the state. So run the test and pass. So I now know that my refactoring in my test is, is, um, is still passing my tests. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the third test, which is what happens if I'm the second worst bowler in the world and I roll nothing but one? So every single time I roll, I will knock down one pin. So I define my test method, and then I'm going to define what that test looks like. So we've already defined all the public interfaces, so there's no compilation errors here. I haven't really made too many design decisions from a test method perspective. But my test does fail because it's returning zero, and expect, I expect it to return 20 at this point. So then I'm gonna, now I'm going to have to actually write some code in my, my game object. And I'm going to write the simplest solution to this problem as possible. Every time I roll, I'm just going to increment a private int, uh, a field, a variable called total, which is set, initialized to zero. And then when I call the score method, I'm just going to turn that. It's a very simple solution, but it gets me to pass my tests. So I have now have three passing tests in my class, and I've made the smallest amount of design decisions possible for this class. To move on, we've noticed we have more duplication in our tests, right? So we have two four methods that have I'm rolling twice, right? The only difference is the number of uh, the number of pins I'm knocking down per roll. Uh, and I'm also I also know, and I, I'm a, you might not make this leap the first time you do this, but I, I know that I'm potentially going to pass in how many times I want to roll that. So I might want to roll 17 times of uh, knocking down five pins just for my test. So I'm going to go ahead and refactor this code to create a roll many method in my test that's going to support my unit tests. And I'm going to basically have two numbers, uh, the number of times I want to roll and how many pins I want to knock down. And it's just going to go ahead and uh, roll that number of times. And so now my tests, each of them is very small and it's very readable as well. So this is another aspect and something you want to aspire to. Someone can come back in here and say, OK, I'm rolling 20 times and knocking down one. It's easier to understand that method name than it is to understand the for loop here. And this is something that as developers, you, you, can, you should think about what, what um, the person behind you is going to look at your code and, and say. So I run this test and I pass, right? OK, so we have a lot of passing tests, and so we're ready to move on to a much harder problem, right? So in theory, we could roll, we could calculate the score for any number of rolls throughout our game with a simple architecture. But now we're going to figure out how to calculate the spare. So with the spare, um, the calculation is a little harder. And I didn't have the same set I should add the uh, actual calculation. But what it is is, if I, you're, for a spare, you're knocking down with two rolls, 10 pins in a frame. But the score for that first frame is the 10 pins plus whatever you roll on the, on the first time you roll in the next frame, right? So in this case, what I've done is I rolled a five the first time, and I rolled a five the second time, which gave me a spare. In the second frame, I rolled a three, 
and then I rolled the gutter balls the rest of the game. So now I have my score for the first frame is 10 plus 3. So the first frame score is 13, the second frame score is 3. So it gets complicated, right? So essentially you get a bonus from the next frame. Um, and so essentially my score here will be 13 plus 3, which is 16. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a, it's a complicated calculation, um, and I, when I run this test, I, it fails. All right, so we're going to go look at our game class now, and we're going to see it. Look at how this, this is currently structured. And what you're going to do is you may figure this out as you write tests, or you may figure this out just by looking at it. I have a problem. I, I have, first of all, a design problem, which is my role class is actually poorly named in this case, because my role class is actually, um, it should be just capturing the role and storing that, but it's actually calculating the score. It's doing the calculation of the score. My score class is doing, my score method is doing nothing. So we have, we've made some, our, our, we need to change our design, and we're going to use our tests to ensure that as we refactor our design, that we didn't change anything. But to do that, we have a failing test already. So I'm going to go back and comment out that failing test. We're not going to add this feature yet because we're going to go back and change our design before we add this failing test. So this is going to be noise as we refactor. Okay. So we're going to go back and refactor our design. And what we're going to do is. <coughs> I'm going, to I'm going to change the role method to add, to say basically just capture and add um, that role into, the, into a array. And I've initialized an array to 21, and I'll tell you why later that we have 21 and not 20. And then the current role is just in, it's a counter. Okay? So this guy's going to increment the counter to the next role and add the pin, the pin there. But I haven't removed the old calculation module there, right? So I've added this logic in here, and I run the tests, and it still passes. So I actually haven't altered how this class works yet. I've just added some logic in that I think I'm going to need. Then I'm going to go ahead and change the score method to calculate the score now. So now instead of just using the total that we're incrementing there in the role method, I'm going to go through the roles collection that I have, or the roles array, and then calculate the score from that, and then return the score. So now my score method is actually calculating the score. My role method is, is just capturing the pins. I run this test, I pass. So now I have, uh, I've changed the design of, and so my, my methods now are perfectly named and they're doing what they say they're doing. But I also have some noise here because now I have this leftover total and total up there. So I can just remove that, that logic here and run my test again to ensure that by removing code, I didn't change behavior and it passes the test. So I just successfully refactored the design of my code with tests as a safety net. And that, this is the power of TDE, that you can continually refactor your design and change it without fear that you're actually breaking functionality. So, all right, so I'm gonna move back onto my test. All right, I'm ready for the spare logic now. We're ready, we just refactored our design a little bit, and so we're gonna go back and then comment out our spare, roll spare method. And so we're gonna go back and look at our class now, it's still half failed because we haven't actually solved the problem yet for this one. We haven't solved this test. So we go back and look at our class. Um, and okay, so what we're, when I describe the concept of how you score a, a spare, I describe it as you have this score in the first frame, this score in the second frame, right? So our design doesn't right now understand the concept of frames. But in order to calculate a spare, you need to understand the concept of frame. So this is, as we talk through the design, I, I, I'm realizing that, that I'm going to need to make this decision. So I know now I have a second design problem in my code, which is my code needs to understand frames in order to properly solve this problem. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back and comment out my code again, because I want to now introduce the concept of frames to solve the problem for the previous test that had passed, so that I can properly solve this new test. So. I'm going to re update my score method to start counting frames. So I'm going to introduce 10 frames in a for loop. And then what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the score by saying add the frame and the, the rolls in the first, first roll, and then the second roll, and then increment by two to count it, right? So it's always going to grab, every time it goes to this loop, it's going to grab one, two, one, two, right? So in, and that's going to pass a test for the previous written test, not the spare test. But you can see very quickly if you roll a strike, this is going to fail. We haven't added that logic yet, so we're okay with this, okay? 
So we've now introduced the concept of frame, and so now we can actually finally address our failing spare test directly. So now we can say, okay, we're going to calculate how spare works. So then I'm going to add more logic to our score method, and I'm going to say, for each roll, if this, the count of the first and second roll is going to be equal to 10, we have identified a spare. And that, then we're going to go ahead and calculate the score of 10, which is the first frame, plus the next roll, the first roll in the next frame, and then we're going to come by 2. If it's not a spare, just go ahead and calculate the score like we did before. Does that make sense? A lot of fours and ifs in there, so I'll give you a second to uh, read it. But as you we run this test, this passes. So now we've actually added a, a much more complicated uh, calculation in here. But what we're looking at is we're looking at what I consider fairly ugly code, right? So we have and, and, and you see multiple levels of indention. Um, you see magic variable names like I. What does I mean, right? So we're going to do this refactoring. And by the way, we're not going to go through all the possible refactoring in this. You guys can probably see many ways you can refactor and improve the code. And there are many ways you can refactor and improve the code. I'm just using, we're using this as an example of how tests can drive the design. So I'm going to change, for instance, the name of I to frame index um, and rerun my test and pass. So I can change name, variable names very easily and know that I'm not changing the behavior that I've implemented in my code. I also don't like the comment, you go back one friend, or one slide. I don't like the fact that I have this comment right here, spare, because this goes back to, um, there's, a, there's business logic in there that um, you know, is it, implied based on that for loop or that if statement, right? So it, does, it has no meaning. So I, and anytime you have little comments in there of why you're doing something, that's a smell, you probably need to add, a, change the design a little bit. I saw, saw a hand. Yeah, are you going to go through uh, how it thickens for boundary cases? I don't know if bowling very well, but I don't know whether there are edge cases with, with spares. Yeah. I mean, that, that looks fairly complex, but I don't know. Right, and I don't think we will. I think this, this, this whole, the, the purpose of our talk is really to introduce okay. the concept of how you would evolve a design with the tests. But I think that we can talk afterwards, and there's going to be the, the code katas, we'll get into that a lot. So, um, but that is a good question. Um, so, going back to this. I don't like the fact that I have a for loop with an if statement that has a spare, so I'm going to refactor the code to introduce an is spare method, right? So this becomes a little more readable, right? I'm going to, this method has the same logic that had the if statement had, basically it turns true or false if it's a spare, but um, I, it's a lot more readable now. So I can see when I read this for loop, so if it's a spare, do this, else do that. So the code becomes a little more readable for the next guy coming in. I run my test and this passes. So this is a very simple example. I'm not going to go into how you calculate the strike because it's a little complicated. And the 21 I, I introduced, I, I talked about, you can, in bowling, you can roll, on the last frame, you can roll three strikes in a row. So you actually have 21 possible rolls in bowling. But you can see how each time I would add more and more behavior that requirements, and then it would fail, and then I would evolve the design of the test. Then when I solved all the behavioral requirements of my design, then I would go back and actually refactor the design to be meaningful. And that's that red, write a failing test, green, write a path, pass the test with as simple a code as possible, possibly with hard coding values, and then refactor as you go. And this concept of you know, red, green, refactor doesn't come naturally to developers. I mean, if you are looking, looking at this and saying, you know, I would never do it that way, I know exactly how to calculate this up front. Um, a lot of people probably would in this example, but um, it takes trying it and knowing it, and that's why, you know, when Claudia and I had talked a long time ago about how we get start getting developers comfortable about running, you know, writing unit tests, we, you know, the code kata, the whole idea, and using code kata is a practice. So I definitely recommend if you guys, you know, feel any apprehension about how TDD works, um, definitely try code katas. But I want to go back and, and cover the design decisions we've made. One, we focused on how a customer or client or consumer of our application would use this, so we're making design decisions as if we're a consumer, right? So there's powerful, there's, a, there's powerful um, techniques there that you can use and say, say, I don't need this method, or, or this is the most optimal way that someone would use it. Um, I'm refactoring, I'm changing design without changing behavior. That's the definition of refactoring. 
So I'm empowered to do that with my tests. And I have confidence that when I change the design, I'm not impacting what the, the requirements are of this code. And then um, I'm also deferring design decisions to the last responsible moment. And this is an agile tenant you'll hear people talk about, but uh, you want to avoid the whole big upfront design, right? Where we're sitting there using UML and making elaborate class diagrams and, and saying this is the optimal class design. That should evolve through your behavior. Define your behavior of what you want the system to do and make the design solve that problem. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so we just went through a bowling game and, and probably what you're saying is the first thing that I said when I saw a bowling game, which was, that's great, how often do I have to design a bowling game? Um, or, you know, what, what does this really mean when I'm thinking I'm an enterprise developer or you know I'm developing real systems that people are using, I'm not dealing with stuff like this, it was one class. How does this really apply to the bigger picture, right? And so being that it's Friday, um, you know, the boss comes by and he says, hey, guess what? We've got some new requirements for the bowling game that you're gonna have to code over the weekend. So, what, what are these changes that uh, this great guy has decided that you're going to make to the, the game that we just went through? So the bowling game is becoming service oriented. Uh, this came down from your CIO. He said, you know what, we're going service oriented. We need to you know, call out to other services and, and everything's got to be service oriented just because I say so. And the new requirement is that we need to post roles in real time because eventually we're going to be web enabled and everybody's going to want to know as soon as a role happens, what, what was that score? And, and what did they roll? So somehow we've got to integrate this into what we already did. So, so what I'm trying to demonstrate is that you know, we don't just have the bowling game, we're gonna have external factors. And what we call those are collaborators. So a collaborator is an external interface or an external service, an external web service, database, whatever it might be, is an external thing that your code is relying upon or has to interact with, okay? And so in order to satisfy this requirement, we were given an interface, the role notification service. Uh, it's extremely simple. All you're gonna do is publish the information from a role to some notification service, okay? So we talked earlier about the fact that we want to not rely on external interfaces. We wanna test one thing and one thing only, and that's the bowling game. So how can we test that the role notification service is actually being called properly with the proper information while only testing the game? And the way we go about that is using something called a test double. Um, so there's several, several different types of test doubles. We've got dummies, stubs, fakes, mocks, and spies. And what they're all doing in a little different way um, is trying to stand in for the thing that you're trying to test and decouple the, the class under test from these external dependencies, okay? So we want something to be able to stand in and simulate what it is that we're testing against so that we're really keeping the testing to the one thing and that's our, our game test and that's our game. So we want to test against the interface. We want to create a test double for that interface, whatever it may be, one of these types of test doubles to stand in for that role notification service so we can still test that our game is behaving the way we expect. Um, and the one we're going to go over today is Mox. So one of the great things about Mox, actually before I get into the next part, one of the great things about Mox is that you are able to set up your expectations beforehand in your test. So as opposed to creating a, an additional class or anything like that, the way that Mike had put his um, bowling game inside of the test, you can also control the behavior of the external dependencies within that test as well, so that you're not going back and forth between all these new classes and trying to figure out how am I gonna test this thing. Um, you can have it right inside. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new test. Um, we're going to create the notify service per role test. And if you, when Mike talked earlier about it being readable, we've got, what we want to do is we want to test that we're notifying the services when we make a role, right? So we've got all our previous tests, we've got our game as we've created before, and we've got this new notify service per role. So uh, this got ugly real fast, and I'm going to explain it to you. So we're going to walk through each part. So what we're going to do is use uh, a new library called Mockito, and that's a simple J Java library to support mocking frameworks. So it's, it's a mocking framework itself. It supports creating mocks in your tests. So what we've done is we fill in the middle. We've got 
the interface here, we've got the role notification service, right? And we haven't created that. Just like before, we're not gonna go ahead and create these things before we're ready to use them, okay? Then we've also got a mock service, which is the name that we're giving to the service. So this is declarative saying that we're, we're gonna mock this service. We're not using a real service, okay? This is actually uh, Mockitos, and you can see that I'm importing Mockito.mock. I'm going to mock the role notification service dot class. What that's saying is we don't have an actual implementation. We're just gonna have this stand in. And what the framework does is allows you to pass this in and use it just like you were using a concrete implementation, but you don't have to create it. So it's great. I don't have to worry about going to create another class and what does that behavior look like or anything like that. What I'm doing is I'm just creating a stand-in. It's super simple and it's just this one method to create it for the class, it's under test. Now, another thing that we're doing is we're going to have to create a dependency on the mock service, or on the, on the uh, role notification service through that interface. And how do we get that service into the class to be used? So what we're going to do is we're going to modify our game class. We don't currently have a constructor, but we're going to need a constructor to actually pass in that notification service. So this is the dependency inversion principle that Mike talked about before. We're not passing in a concrete implementation to the game. We're just passing in the mock. And when we actually really use the class, we can pass in concrete implementation. We're getting a nice mock standard. So this is the actual thing you're going to test because what we want to do is notify on a role. So when we do a bowling game about role, just like we did before, we want to ensure that the service got notified. Okay? And Mockito, once again, provides a very nice interface. It's very readable. And what we're going to do is we're going to verify that the publish method, which is the, the one defined by the interface, was called on whatever class it is that we're using as a mock. So we're using this mock service. So we want to verify that publish was called on mock service with the correct data. So it's actually testing two things. Testing that the publish was called on the service, on the external dependency, and we're also testing that it was called with the correct parameters. So we're getting a lot of utility out of Mox, but we haven't actually created anything yet. So what we've got first is that this is obviously going to fail. It fails in a lot of ways. It fails in compilation, and it fails in actual execution. I have a question. Yep. Uh, to verify, is that part of the, the mocking library? Yes. Yes. Did you see the imports up there? There's two static imports up there for static methods. So mock and verify. Thank you. All right, so now we've got to go back and create our role notification service interface, uh, the one that we defined earlier. So we created empty. Um, so, and it still doesn't pass because we still haven't completed what we need. We do get part of it, so part of it is passed. We're now no longer right here. We know what the role notification service interface is, but we never created the publish. We never created the publish method on that interface. So we can't mock it yet because mock framework doesn't even know what that method is. Additionally, we also haven't created a constructor to pass the service in as well. So right here, we've created two new constructors. We've got an empty constructor, so the previous tests will pass, right? So they didn't take in a service, they didn't know about it, so this should enable them to pass. And then we've got the game passing in a role notification service and setting that to an internal variable. So keeping track of this service so that we can call it later on. Oh, still failed. So we still don't have the publish method. Um, Got to go back and add that. So now we've added publish. So now the mocking framework knows, okay, I've got this publish method available. It takes in two integers. Um, now we should be all set. Nope, what happened? We forgot something. So here we've got um, role that is not calling the service. So this is what we actually get from the mocking framework. So this is a extremely easy to read error on why this didn't pass, right? Wanted but not invoked, role notification service dot publish. Should actually be a, a one, just like the values that we're passing in. Actually, there were zero interactions with this mock. So what this is telling you from the mocking framework is saying, you, you never called what you said you were gonna call. You put the verify statement in there, verify that this thing got called, but you never called it. So you need to put that into your code so that you can actually get it to pass. So here we go. So we created it with the role notification service. We're using that 
that service that we pass in, we're calling publish, we're passing in the current role, and we're passing in the number of pins that we hit. And it's still ready. Uh-oh, we got a null pointer exception. So remember earlier when I said that, oh, we didn't, we, you know, this should cover the previous tests? That doesn't cover the previous tests because they actually are going to need to call this too. This is getting called for every test every time. So what can we do to go back and fix that? So what we're going to do for the purposes of this test, and there are many ways to fix this, I know, but um, just for the purposes of this test, what we're going to do is create a default implementation. So imagine that the service has not been created yet, right? So you're way ahead of the other developer. He's creating this notification service, but it's just not done yet, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is create this nil role notification service, which is just <coughs> nothing. So it's a concrete implementation that we can use to pass to other tests, but it's not actually going to do any interaction to send out to some service, but we can use it to fill in where we need it. So this is one way of doing it. Um, there are many ways, but this is just the simplest, straightforward way um, to do what we need to do. So in our empty constructor, which is for all our tests that we wrote previously, we're going to pass in this nil role notification service, which actually won't hit anything. Okay. And then when we run the test now, we're green. So all of our previous tests have passed, and what we've done is we were able to ensure that the behavior of all the previous tests worked. We've introduced uh, an external collaborator, which is a notification service, and we've done a very simple verification that what we expected to get called on this external collaborator actually got called using the mocking framework. And once again, the really nice part about using mocks is that you can determine the behavior of the mock at the time that you're creating the test. So ours is very simple where it's just verifying that something was called. If you wanted the mock to perhaps return different data um, per test or something like that, you can set that up at the beginning of your test or in the setup method of, of uh, whatever testing framework we're using and then change the behavior within the test so you can test different test conditions. Any questions on Mockito? I know it's kind of a complicated concept if you haven't introduced familiar with unit tests or, or how mocking frameworks work? Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for uh, attending our talk. Um, just, just a picture of my kid and, and Sam's is coming soon. So very, very if you guys want to contact us with any questions, we'll be around all day. Um, yeah, but feel free to email us or tweet us or um, anything. So thank you. Thanks very much.